All right, what's up everybody? Looks like we are live. Uh, so I've got kind of a fun episode planned for today, or live stream, I guess I'll say. Um, but first, let me turn down my mic a little bit. Because I think I'm probably going to be talking louder than usual because I'll have my earbuds on. So uh, today we are going to be implementing Simple Stack. Uh, in for the Android client of my uh, demo application that I'm building. And uh, so SimpleStack is a library which um, was created by Gabor Verati, also known as at Zwinden, also known as Epic Panda Force on uh, Stack Overflow. If you've asked a question on Stack Overflow about Android, chances are he's answered one of your questions. So... Um, yeah, Gabor's agreed to jump on and sort of make sure that I'm implementing it properly. And I'm sure we'll, there's a pretty good chance we'll ramble about some other stuff, sort of like setting up a Compose and XML type architecture and and things like that. So super excited for the stream today. Um, I'm just going to invite him to a call and uh, we'll see if we can get this set up. All right, just give me a few minutes. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Gabor. Are you already on stream? I am. We are live, yeah. Uh, just going to try to get the audio levels. Did you tweet about it? <laughs> I did tweet about it, yep. You did? Two minutes ago. Okay, retweeting. That is the uh, the extent of my social media presence is I, I tweet now and again. I got to be more like Florian. He's got like TikTok, he's got Instagram, LinkedIn. Yeah, he does ride a wave on TikTok, I think. Like these 30 second coding videos and then TikTok, TikTok's algorithm shows it to like a million people. Pretty yeah. good discoverability. <laughs> oh yeah, his ability to like do that kind of stuff is uh, pretty epic. All right. So, um... Yeah, so I think what I, I'm just trying to think of the best way to do this. I might show you my screen through, uh, oh, I can't do 7, 1080p. All right, through Discord there. So just to um, get uh, you and the viewers up to speed, I did actually get started implementing your library in the Android nice. client. So I'll just show you as far as I made it. Um, so, and also people uh, consider checking out this uh, library and the repository for it. I actually cloned the repository and I've been using the samples here as uh, basically a, a guide and the documentation is very good for it. The only downside that I really need to catch up with is that uh, Target SDK 34 is coming eventually, but uh, and and with that, Compile SDK 33 was coming, and that's why Ombak Press is deprecated, right? So if oh, in the yeah. README there's a short section that I didn't really like the code for it, but uh, it's kind of unavoidable. Uh, which talks about how to integrate with the Ombak Press dispatcher for now. And uh, I think we should update the code to that from the readme. You really just have to like copy paste it from the readme and it will work. But <laughs> okay. by that way, because we are going to use Compose anyway. Yep. Uh, and if you were to use back handlers and stuff, you would need to do that. Okay, good to know. I think it's uh, below that by a little bit. There's ah warning regarding integration against Onback Press Dispatcher. This is the one. So if we use this code here instead. Okay. Oh, I did say poor design decisions. Not on my part, but on that they need to break every single code base <laughs> that uses Onback Press. But uh, technically, what they want to do with it makes sense. They did this because uh, when you are on the root 
activity and there's no, nothing to go back to, then if you're using gesture navigation, then they want to put the app gradually into the background. So you see that, oh wait, the app is being closed. And then you can like be like, okay, never mind. I actually don't want to close the app. <laughs> yeah. And this is why they have to know ahead of time if you want to handle back or not. Interesting. I actually did implement um, the on back press callback in the previous company I was working at. And it was weird at first, but I eventually got it to work. But I had to have like the code, um, not necessarily this exact function, but uh, some code to handle it in every fragment, um, sort of individually. Yeah, uh, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And in a way, that was nice because there were different fragments where. I had like some conditional logic um, mm -hmm. based on like auth state and things like that, but, um, and also which previous fragment had sent the user to the current fragment and things like that. So, but yeah, it feels clunky <laughs> compared to like the old way of doing it. Yeah, previously we just get on back press, then you handle it. Now you have to have this callback which stores a Boolean as to whether it's active that's bound to the correct life cycle because in a fragment you need to give it the view life cycle owner otherwise you will get bugs yeah yep. the second half of the readme is still missing from here like you have the core bug but you also have to register it yeah all right uh by the way i see we have a couple people watching what's up breens uh can everyone just confirm are the audio levels for gabor and i good it sounds good from my end but uh just want to make sure that's sounding all right. Yeah. Can you actually hear me? <laughs> I can hear you loud and clear. There was a time when I was streaming a game and I thought that the volumes are good. For me, the music of the game was blasting. And in the end result, I heard that it's at like 20% for the viewers. And I'm like, well, how is this even possible? Oh, yeah. No matter so you how... never know. <laughs> Exactly. Like no matter how good you think it is as like the streamer, it's always good to ask the audience. Looks like we're good. Awesome. All right. Um, let me just juggle some windows here for a second. Um, cool. So uh, what I got started doing, um, I sort of refactored some of the code um, for the activity. I created a uh, navigation package, and this is where I have my navigation keys. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I noticed in the documentation, um, the most current approach is to use an object class without yeah, the... Yeah, data object specifically. Yeah, so I ran into the issue of you have to have like Kotlin 1.7.2, I think. Mm-hmm. Now, oh, and I'm pretty sure Compose wouldn't be up to date enough for that. Like, uh, I think you need 1.8.0 actually. Oh, okay. So what I did is I tried playing around with like the Android plugin and multi-platform Kotlin plugins versions, and it just broke I don't everything. Think the 1710 <laughs> has it. Yeah, so I I'm probably gonna have to go. I think with the data classes, but uh, it's not that big of a deal. Just a little extra. Yeah, I data have been counter. using the data classes for a long time and it works just fine. Uh, it like uh, you have to give it that parameter about the new argument placeholder, but it's still better than having to remember to override to string and equals and hash code. Yeah, especially to string because the find fragment by tag like uh, the fragment tag uses the keys to string and if the to string is uh, unstable like because after process that you have a new value because the default to string uh, adds the instance identifier to the end of the string right so after process that you would get a different tag <laughs> if, that's not good. and the library <laughs> wouldn't be able to find your fragment so that's why you have to use data classes here or data objects okay that makes sense and just at a high level, these keys, is this essentially like um, in concepts, it's similar to like the uh, tags you would set for a fragment in a fragment manager? Like it's an identifier for a specific fragment and it's a way you can like get a hook to an instance of it or something like that? 
pretty much uh, because the keys, especially when you're using it for fragments, it identifies two things. One of them is the fragment tag because it uses uh, key, the keys to string to f get the, the fragment tag. And the other thing is that it contains the arguments of a screen. So instead of like having to be like bundle.get string, bundle, but whatever, uh, you can actually just get the key and you get every parameter from that uh, in a type safe way. The only thing that isn't type safe, of course, is having to know what the type of the key is because it's a parsable, right? So it's calling get parsable on the bundle and you have to know that your driver dashboard fragment uses driver dashboard key, but that's not very tricky to remember. Yeah, okay. It's easier Makes than sense. concatenating strings. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So um, I think what might be an idea, I just want to take a step back. I have some questions about um, the library, it looks like we can um, sort of add this conditional navigation where, say, if the user is not authenticated or is authenticated, then we can, on like first load of the application, send them to an appropriate place. Is that correct at all? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Usually in apps, uh, we we, <laughs> I know people tend to say that uh, you shouldn't have a splash screen, but I get a design specification and it says you should show the splash screen for a second. And that's where we usually check, although you still have to handle it after process that. So yeah, you can override what the current screen should be with no real problem, actually. <laughs> okay. That was my thinking is um, I would do that checking in the splash screen, which reminds me I need to add that feature in. So just to give you a really quick rundown, uh, the application has basic, basic authentication. Um, it's like a ride sharing app, like Uber Lite. I'm calling mm -hmm. it Unter, which uh, Florian found funny because he's German, but no one else seems to get the joke. <laughs> and... Uh, I did yeah. learn German for six years, but I barely remember any of it. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so don't take it personally. I somehow passed classes at school. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> That's how I would describe it. All right. So uh, every user just starts off as a passenger. They can fill out a form, a very simple form, just uh, avatar, image, and a description of their uh, their vehicle. And once they're in that state, they can, or once they've filled that out, they can either be a passenger or a driver. Um, so that is one of the pieces of state which will dictate which dashboard we send them to. There's a passenger dashboard, and then there is a driver dashboard. Um, even though a lot of the UI is repetitive, um, I will actually have these as separate uh, features because dry. Uh, or not dry. <laughs> um, and so the main thing that I need to be aware of is the state of two things so far. Uh, let me see. Did I even add these to the shared module yet? So the state of this ride object, which represents like a ride in progress, and a user object, these two resources will basically drive the user interface largely. So whether the user is, uh, and then also whether the user is logged in or not. So like if they're, if they're of a type um, passenger and they're logged in and they don't have an active ride, then they'll be sent to like uh, this screen, for example. And then if they're in the driver mode, then they'll be sent over to this screen. So kind of what I was wondering is, it seems like we can easily do authentication. We jump into the splash screen and we check, is the user, does the user have a session or not? And that'll be through Firebase. Um, 
And then do you think it would be worth even like adding some conditional lo logic, assuming they are logged in, that we can send them either to the driver or passenger dashboard? We definitely can. Do you think it's a good idea as kind of using simple stack? I mean, simple stack won't get in the way with that. Like, uh, you can always just call set history and set the history to whatever you want. Okay. Interesting. Um, let me just throw together that uh, splash screen feature really quick. I, so um, this is kind of hilarious. I was using the uh, the fragment wizard, and I found that found out that it adds an erroneous uh, import to one of the build Gradle files every time I do it. <laughs> what does it import that doesn't exist? <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> oh oh my god, uh, that's fine. Yeah, we dealt with this last time I was streaming. So it's gonna have a build. Uh, suddenly, it's gonna fail to build. And then it what? adds it adds this here, and it just breaks everything. <laughs> wow! So, why? <laughs> so I'll get rid of that. I don't and then think they know either. <laughs> I, I don't get that. Maybe it's like an issue with KTS or something. Like I don't know. So yeah, we just Possible. delete that. Uh, did we actually register the on press callback in on create based on the readme? Just just checking. I'm I don't think I did. So I don't think we did. I think we did create the on press callback, but I don't think yeah. we called register at the end of on create. That would we be here. Grab I'm that from the readme. Uh, this down here as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one is very important. The on back pressed itself being final and that's just like a, a notification that it's this no longer should be edited because it's such a tricky thing though, because the reason why this uh, no longer works is that super on back press, like when you call super dot on back press, that's when you ask the on back press dispatcher, hey, is there anyone who's registered to handle on, on like on back press, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you add something above it, then it would run before, like for example, a dialogue that's on top of the screen or that sort of thing. And uh Afterwards, you would call super on back pressed to say, hey, is there anything else on this screen that wants to handle back? And if you were to do anything after that, then super on back press would already, uh, already navigate to the previous screen or destroy oh. the activity or stuff like that. Like you cannot implement logic in super okay. on back pressed if on back press dispatcher is relied on. And I was like, there's no way to fix this. So apparently the, after that, I I was pretty vocal about this on Twitter for like three months. And then suddenly they're like, yeah, on press is deprecated. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, I get it. Okay, that makes sense. And that's when I came up with this uh, uh, on press this uh, on press callback that unregisters itself. This is the only way to intercept back at the right time. But I will still need to eventually figure out a way to like... Uh, you know how there are scoped services in SimpleStack? You don't use them yet. I see that you don't, but I haven't you know yet. about them, right? Uh, I haven't looked into them. Uh... They are um... super powerful. But uh, the reason services. why I still haven't figured out how to properly migrate from own backrest, uh, well, two reasons. One of them is the SimpleStack does not depend on Android X at all. Okay. Like, this is a really cool thing because back when Android support migrated to Android X, I just had to remove like the main thread annotations and other than that, it would just work. You would be able, you would have been able to use it both with Android support library and with Android X. I was completely unaffected by Android X <laughs> migration, right? <laughs> wow. I'm not sure but, how many uh, people can say that. <laughs> yeah, because, um, 
like dependencies can break your code, right? So if you don't have any of them, I only depend on state bundle, which is also my own code. So um, so that avoided some bugs, but uh, now with the OnWebPress dispatcher, I either need to ask the users to be like, hey, uh, either override OnWebPress for, tar for build versions below Tiramisu, or use Android X core stuff. And I'm like, I don't know which one it should be. Yeah, that's a tough call. Um, let me just yeah. uh, read the chat for a sec. So uh, oh, Shashank right. says, I implemented this library. Uh, speaking of simple stack, I presume. Gabor, thanks for helping me out. Amazing library. It made my app from activities to fragments uh, with my, I'm assuming he means uh, without much change in the logic itself. Yes, without. Okay. Thank you, Shashank. I'm and... happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, we that's... have been using Simple Stack for like six years now. <laughs> awesome. And it works really well. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to use it is I know you use it in situations where the things that it solves are critically important. Because uh... So that's why I wanted to give it a shot too. Plus, I, I don't hate... I used to hate the navigation library. Um, over time and using it work, I there were I could get it to solve the problems I needed generally, but I never really liked the whole XML approach. Anyways, let me shut up. Um, Pamba is asking, who am I talking to? Uh, so this is Gabor Varadi, also known as at Zwinden on Twitter, and he is also the creator of. The simple stack library, which I'm actually uh, using right now, um, and uh, Nong Kao says how I can code UI and logic with Kotlin and build for iOS. Um, so you can Nong, you can use uh, Kotlin multi-platform mobile KMM, which I am using in this project now for logic. Depending on what you want to do, it's pretty easy to share. You could, for example, include the logic in the uh, common main um, source set of the shared module. If you don't know what any of those things are, unfortunately, I can't explain it to you in a couple minutes, but you can share common code. When it comes to things tightly coupled to the UI, that's a whole nother situation. You could not, for example, write XML layouts and share them with the iOS uh, front end or client application. Um, it looks like we're slowly trying to get to the point where eventually you could do some composables on iOS, but I believe that's still very experimental. So, Also, we just got a question from a Mohammed asks, does it work well with bottom navigation? I think it does, doesn't it, Gabor? Simple stuff. Well for bottom navigation, I tend to use child fragments, which is actually uh, much easier to use than the safe state restore state thing in the official library. Okay, uh, good to know. I have a sample for it. I think I can like uh, just link it for a second. But don't know if... I definitely... I I noticed in the beginner sample, you we did have, or sorry, basic uh, Kotlin fragment sample, we did have a navigation view. I'll open up what uh, Gower's linking here. To be honest, I should really update that to use this approach instead. I generally don't, uh, you, I don't tend to expose the bottom navigation's destinations as keys. I tend to have them as child fragments of one view. Like I always need to have like a, a bottom navigation that hosts like five fragments, for example, and uh, need the bottom navigation on that screen. But then when you navigate into a detail screen, you typically don't show the bottom navigation anymore. Yeah. And for that, I generally refer to the sample that you're looking at right now. Okay, interesting. Like, this is not simple stack specific. This is just like me using fragments to uh, show child fragments. That's how I tend to do it. Okay, good to know. 
And the fascinating thing about that is that it just works. The only thing I tend to have to change about it is that uh, I often have to replace attach and detach with show and hide so that uh, while you're navigating between the fragments, you don't actually destroy the view, <laughs> which okay. when one of your tabs or two of them is a web view, it's really jarring as the Ooh. entire screen like just refreshes, reloads, stuff like that. And I'm like, this looks terrible. So I have to add like show hide. And with the official library, you wouldn't even be able to do that. You would be forced to recreate the, fra the fragment view each time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. We all love web views, don't we? Um, okay. So in the sample here, so for your main activity, you're, you're set up with like the basic simple stack navigation. And then we go to root screen. I'm guessing that would be root fragment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the thing I was just wondering about with this example, let's say so we're we're flipping through the different bottom nav screens. Let's say we go mm -hmm. to a detail screen. Um, does that? Are we going to be you using? Don't... If go you ahead. don't need to show the bottom navigation while you're on the detail then it's really as simple as uh, backstab that go to detail key id okay interesting okay and there's the detach and attach that you were talking about yep cool i haven't actually messed around with child fragments and having a root fragment ever so this is uh this is interesting android is I amazing like <laughs> copy paste this and it works <laughs> yeah those are the best solutions uh we have another comment According to what you said, logic is handled in the shared folder. I have to handle views separately for my Android and iOS. Basically, that's correct. Where should I start to code KMM UI with iOS? Well, um, I don't want to ramble for, on this for too long, but um, so the first thing is you will need Xcode. So you'll need a Mac of some kind. Um, if you don't have a Mac computer, you basically can't do an iOS front end in KMM. Um, you could do like a desktop JVM front end and an Android front end, and I think JavaScript as well. But that's the first hurdle is you have to have a Macintosh. Um, and then, honestly, to get started, I would suggest you look at the JetBrains channel, YouTube channel. They have like a, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's like getting started with KMM or something like that. Uh, let me see if I can just find it. Yeah, this is basically the video. Um, getting started with Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile, KMM Beta. This is a more recent video, and this is super useful. I just want to point out, they get you to use KDoctor somewhere, which is a handy tool, because one thing that's a major pain in the ass, I find, is configuring a Mac for KMM. And uh, yeah, this tool, K Doctor. But yeah, you can watch the video and listen to the people actually know what they're talking about, tell you. But uh, it helps you get set up because there's a, quite a bit of ceremony. <laughs> Anyways, so let's jump back into my project here. Uh, let me just set up a little bit of boilerplate for the splash screen. Uh, I'll just say splash key, whatever. Splash fragment. Okay, so Gabor, I want to go probably... So this is immediately, a, I have a question in my head here. Let's okay. say I want to implement that sort of check using simple stack where we check if the user is logged in. Would I do that in the main activity or would I do that in like the splash fragment? Do you, yeah, think? you can do either. So whichever you prefer. Uh, I personally tend to do it in the splash fragment. Okay. So then that would mean, I believe, we want to start with the splash key here, right? Yep. Okay. Um, that'll shoot us over to the splash fragment. Oh, I, cause it's a class I need to instantiate. 
is there anything else you see in this activity that I might want to um, set up or, or even just no. consider? Well, if you want to do uh, scope services, then eventually you would have that on the navigator, but that's it. Okay. Um, it, could you explain to me, like I'm a six-year-old, because mentally I'm pretty <laughs> close, what is a scoped service? Maybe not uh, six-year-old, but... Well, it depends on whether I should assume that you know what Android X view models are or not. Let's assume I know what Android X view models are. Sure. Okay, let's say you know about Android X view model. So you know how view model stores data across configuration changes. Yep. So when you rotate the screen, then whatever is in the view model would not get destroyed. It would be kept alive. So uh, scoped services, as they also live in the same non-configuration instance scope, just like retained fragments, view models, uh, they also survive configuration changes. That's the number one thing they do. They basically do the same thing that Android X view model is doing, except I think, I'm not sure which one was made earlier, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I made this before view model really was a thing. Um, and uh, the reason why scope services are better than view models is because uh, there's a bit of a difference in how, not how, uh, when they are instantiated, because when they are created, because uh, what I'm referring to is that uh, scope services are classes. They are just regular classes that are, that you instruct simple stack to create for you if a given screen is in the history, right? So okay, what you say sense. is that what you say is that uh, in like for example in your key that's how I tend to they, they do it anyway. That's the default. Uh, in your key, you say, on this screen, these are the classes that I need, and they will get added. Like you add them to a service binder. You get a service binder and you go service binder that add this class instance. And in that case, that class instance is stored across configuration changes. And you use this other function called lookup service or lookup if you're in Kotlin uh, to get an instance of that uh, class that you added. And the reason why this is cool is because uh, if you add one on the first screen, then you can also look it up on the second or third or fourth screens. Like you can actually share data between screens by just having a scope service registered on a previous screen. And if you cannot guarantee that the first screen exists, like it's, for example, a skippable step, then you can also define the define a parent scope where you say that I associate these keys with this scope. And if any of these keys exist, then I want this class added. And that way you can like have like a multi-step flow where you collect data in this overarching view model like thing that if you implement bundleable, then it can also survive process that and get restored automatically. And that's the idea. So you, you can share the, like you can store data across config changes, have it rest have state restored across process that with this bundleable callback and uh, share data between screens because it builds a scope hierarchy. It's not like view model where it's all bound to one view model store and you have to have an explicit reference to that specific view model store to get that specific view model. No, you say look up and Oh, and you get an instance of this class if it's registered. Wow, and interesting. You can also implement either activated or registered. I typically need registered, which says, uh, was this class created? And the more important part is, was this class destroyed? So when people are like, I want to have some initialization logic in a view model, so they but they don't really want to do it in the constructor. <laughs> well, that's on-service registered and on-service unregistered. On-service unregistered is just like on-cleared. So when this class no longer exists because the key is no longer in the history, 
uh, then uh, simple stack informs you that if you had any like reactive bindings and whatnot, then this is when you would undo them. So for um, on service registered, would a use case be like here we can start fetching the data? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to try and summarize what you said and correct any parts that are wrong. So a scoped service, it effectively can function as a view model. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so if, if for those who are more familiar with the nav Jetpack Navigation Library, there is a way to scope view models to a particular navigation graph. Um, or you could scope them to like an activity lifecycle or something like that. But this, so scope services um, gives you almost like a loosely coupled version of that. And you can also be a bit more specific about when a service um, should be retained or not. Uh well, the, the service is retained, like the service is kept alive as long as the key that made it to exist, exists, right? So okay. you either have a shared scope with scope key dot child, or you have a, or you have a scope associated with that specific key, which is like, uh, as it, as I originally thought it would be a good idea, but then we had this multi step flow with skippable steps. So I was like, okay, we need to figure something out. <laughs> Okay. And we did. Um, but yeah, it's basically the same idea as Navgraph scoped view models, but it was in, created before Navgraph scoped view models existed for one. And on the other hand, I think it's a bit easier to understand. Okay, interesting. Oh, I didn't actually tell you, like, because of how this lookup stuff works, uh, a view model that's like associated with a given screen can actually use lookup and get a reference to a parent scoped view model in the constructor. Like oh, for example, okay. you have a first step or the second step has its own view model, but it is part of a flow, right? Yeah. And you can you would be able to say lookup flow scoped view model and pass it as the constructor parameter. If you use health, this is impossible. So we have to keep that in mind. This is something that <laughs> navigation cannot do. Sometimes I see people asking about it and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you cannot really do that. Like you can use assisted injection, but then you have to like uh, stop using health view model for the specific view model, stuff like that. Here you actually just say look up and it works. Wow. That is super interesting. Okay. I wish I'd known about this before. I, I'm probably still going to have to use Jetpack via models for the Android front end, but something you I think... You don't have to. <laughs> well, you can use scope services in this app. Yeah, we'll see. I'll have to think about it. One thing I'm... This idea popped in my head, though, and this might be a really stupid idea, so free, feel free to shoot it down, but... Um, and this is actually something I wanted to get your opinion on later, but... So let's say the view model layer, for lack of a better term, truly, um, was Jetpack view models. And then let's say I have like my Firebase service, Firebase auth service, and then uh, real-time database service. Would it make sense to um, turn those things into like scoped services or... Is that kind of just like adding an extra layer in or, or just kind of a dumb decision? <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, Firebase is typically singleton, right? So that doesn't have to be a scope service. Although you do oh. have the other call, like there's set scope services and there's set global services. Global services is how you can define the singleton scope so that you would be able to be like, look up JSON or look up some API class that you have or uh, look up shared preferences, stuff like that. Like uh, you actually, you can add singletons to as like the global scope. That's totally okay. Um, 
it's the view model layer that is typically implemented as scope services instead of Jetpack view models for me. Okay, that makes sense. All right, I'll have to really think about that. Um, yeah, I think, so what I would have to do is, uh, so some of the features of this application will be using Compose. And that mm -hmm. I think that should be pretty straightforward, like in the fragments, uh, whichever is the appropriate function, I, I do the set content. And then there was some other thing I have to do about the scope of the composable. Uh, what was that? I literally tweeted this to myself because I knew I would forget. Uh, it's the disposition strategy, isn't yes. it? Yes, 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 yes. Um, let's maybe, so the splash screen will be compose. Mm -hmm. um, let's just uh, see, does it, would I throw that in, uh, which lifecycle function would I throw that in? Honestly, if the whole view here is going to be compose based, then what uh, the official guide says, like the official documentation says, is to return a compose view from on create view, like an instance of compose view with no XML for it. And that's where you would also set the disposition strategy okay. on that compose view instance. But if you have it in an XML, you would just have to like either find you by ID or view binding it and okay. then set the, but in own create view. Okay. I'm going to see if I can just steal some code from uh, one of your samples. <laughs> uh, it's in. There is one. Oh, there's a compost sample. That's the oh, one I opened you're the wrong find one. It. Oh, probably in compose fragment or Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gabor using an abstract class base class. Uh, to be honest, this is one thing that I tend to think <laughs> about every few weeks. <laughs> is it okay to have this? And my my conclusion these days tends to be no, I should just have an extension function. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's it's one of those things though, it's like if you never actually abuse it, is it a problem? Oh, I screwed that up. Welcome to the uh coding with Ryan where I screw up copy and pasting. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just comment this out. And then we have the disposition. So dispose on view tree lifecycle destroyed. That's mm -hmm. just about as verbose as it uh, can be. And okay, it does cool. say what it does, so that's good. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Um, cool. Okay, and I'll worry about the setting up the view binding. Um, actually, I'm not using view binding here. Um, Okay, so this is one of the main things. Um, we don't have to like go through every, we're not going to go through every view and get it all set up because I can do that on my own time. But um, this is one of the things I wanted to do is like, how can we set this up in a fragment which uses composables? And then how can we set it up in a fragment which doesn't? Um, so you, you brought up services. Uh, I got to decide. Yeah, you do. Do you want view models or do you want scope services? Oh, this is killing me. Um, I don't like change. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time... Um, to be honest, uh, the only thing that would like... Mm, like, as cool as Hilt looks from the outside, that's the thing that prevents you from using creation extras. So... Uh, uh, one of the primary killer features, as they call them, in simple stack is that the scope service actually can get a reference to back stack with like no problem at all. Like when you're creating a class, you also have a reference to the key and uh, the and the back stack, right? So that way, to a view model, you can pass the back stack, and instead of having to be like, hey, I want to pass this event down to the fragment so that the fragment can navigate. No, you actually just call back stack go to in the view model. Like, navigation is a top level layer concern. It's 
you don't have to move it down to the fragment to do it. But you can achieve this now with view models as long as you have access to creation extras. But uh, Hilt doesn't support creation custom creation extras in view models. And that's why I'm like, oh my god, deep. We would almost have feature parity apart from the ability to have scope inheritance, but Hilt does not see it as a priority to have support for creation extras in view models, so it's kind of unfortunate. Okay, yeah. I was actually um, thinking I would sort of write my own uh, view model provider factories instead of using Hilt, because, yeah, that was one thing. I'm trying to be very limited about which libraries I use. And, mm -hmm. um, like if this was just a pure, like sort of jetpack app, then I, I probably would still use Hilt, but, uh, um, I think you should use scope services. <laughs> oh man, you're putting it, me on the it's spot. It's super here. easy. It is super easy. As long as you have the dependencies for it in Gradle, because, you know, I was like, I can't guarantee that people will want to use it in this particular shape and form. So it's an optional dependency to have the default service provider. It's it's in a simple stack extensions. Yeah. Honestly, like, so the, the actual reservation I have is um, against using it is, is largely, um, how can I put this, uh, non-technical. Mm -hmm. So Stream is actually sponsoring me to create a tutorial from this app that I'll building. I'm building. Oh, I don't think they would care. Well, technically, I guess if if uh, they want to see Jetpack stuff in it, they didn't explicitly say that. But and then the other thing is integrating. I don't know. It might be a better idea. They, I don't know. It's hard to speculate. I could just ask them later. We'll see. But yeah, that that's like my actual reservation here. It's not really. Um, you've already technically convinced me that I should basically use scope services. It's really convenient. Um, so I guess my one of my questions though would be, um, once we get into compose land, my current plan is to um. Did I already delete the compose stuff? Yeah, I did the default. <laughs> but my current plan is to pass the view model or scope service into the composable. Um, as far as you know, like there wouldn't be any downsides. Like I know um, Jetpack view model has some integration with uh, working with composables. I think it has like its own sort of ways to set up uh, saved uh, or remembered state. Apologies, folks. It's been a while since I actually wrote any compose. But uh, do you foresee? To be the... honest, I feel the same way in that regard. Like I did fix a recomposition issue back in October, but I haven't used compose since. Oh, okay. Have you used scoped services as view models inside of composables? Or oh, definitely. And it works fine. Yeah. It. It works exactly the same in that regard as view models. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. It really is just a class that survives config changes. Okay. And that, that works fine for me. Because honestly, when I was doing Compose, I wasn't using Jetpack view mo model at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just take a quick look at the chat. We got our resident graph data structure expert, Cybershark. Hello. Um, so Nong asks, uh, do I have a Discord? I do, but I just don't. I don't maintain it, so I'm not gonna share it. Uh, but you, don't worry, you won't be missing anything because I'm literally never on on the server. Um, what's up, Hamba? So, unfortunately, Cybershark, I don't know exactly what you're referring to. Um, apologies for ignoring the chat for a while. Uh, Bargraph comments, I think we can remove the splash screen from Android 12 system is showing the default splash screen. So I think this scenario, two splash screens will be shown. Um, so the reason I, it's not even really a splash screen. It's almost like a dispatch screen. So we would be checking the state 
Um, like let's say for example, the app gets restarted, we would wanna check the state, like is the user logged in? Are they actively in a ride? And from there we would use that to um, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, dispatch them. So I should probably change the name, maybe dispatch fragment. What do you think, Gower? Uh, it's commonly called splash fragment and uh, they typically do uh, this kind of dispatching in splash pretty much always, so I personally wouldn't change it, but it would definitely reduce the chance of people asking, hey, why not just use the built-in splash screen support in Android 12? That's a good point. Um, so well, you could also call it startup key and startup fragment, and then suddenly people will stop asking about it. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll leave it for now, but that's, yeah. Um, Cyber right. Shark is asking, can't we just do this with safe state handle? Uh, I that's been there so long. What is this? <laughs> if Cyber Shark, you are listening, what do you mean by this that you want to do with safe state handle? You can definitely pass arguments to view models through the safe state handle now, by the way, it's true, but you cannot pass a nav controller to a view model. So you would have to do this dance about how uh, sending the event down and then handling it at the activity level because the nav host is in the activity level and the nav host fragment is also at the activity level. Okay. Instead of so creation extras. Yeah, uh, I mentioned creation extras because you would be able to get the backstack into a view model using creation extras. I think my brain didn't fully parse what you had said about that. So if I'm understanding you correctly now, um, we could handle sort of like conditional navigation in the scope service? Yeah, in the view model. You can actually do that in the view model even now, as long as you use creation extras to pass the backstack to the view model. Okay. Interesting. Good to know. Um, Cybertruck is saying, uh, can't we share the same view model with KMM if using scoped services, by the way? If I implement it simple uh, stack in Kotlin multi-platform library, then yes. <laughs> but currently it's Java 1.7. Interesting. That's quite a thought. Because, um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I guess we can't do it now. But I, like, unfortunately, with this application, I'm probably going to have to like, there's not going to be a ton of stuff which is actually shared. Um, I'm hoping to share um, as much business logic as I can. I hate that term, but that's kind of the term that people relatively know what I mean. Um, and uh, for the various SDKs I'll be using, so Firebase SDKs and Stream SDKs, I'll probably use some expect actual magic uh, to manage that stuff. So we'll see, but pretty much I don't expect to be sharing anything in the presentation layer across the two clients. Hopefully I'm wrong about that, but um, we'll see. Anyways. All right. Um, well, let's, let's, uh, Yeah, let's, I guess let's take a look into the scope services. Epic. <laughs> <laughs> you are convinced. Okay, so all you need to do to make that happen is to call dot set scope services default service provider in the main activity. And main that activity. way you have the default setup, which is generally how I use it. Okay, sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Yeah, oh, let so me make here... sure I have it in Gradle. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you do I'm... need to have it in Gradle. Where am I? Oh, I'm using Mac keyboard shortcuts. God damn it. Actually, I think I... <laughs> I just spent 10 months working for a, um, a company using a Mac exclusively, so my muscle memory is all screwed up. Um, let's see. This would be... No, it would be in the Android client. Um, where I do have some of your, here we go. I'm guessing we don't have the services one here. 
I don't think you have services. You have fragments and navigator, but you also would need services and services KTX. Okay. Um, do any of your samples have that handy? Uh, they should. Okay. Especially these uh, extension samples, both the compost sample and the other one. Oh. Let's see here. Why? Uh... Uh, Android view where you cannot find the build gradle because it's Why? all moved to the bottom. I don't know. Why? Why? Okay. Um, okay, so we'll need these two, I presume? Services and services KTX? Yep. Okay. That's the one. And I'll need to convert them into KTX, which is not a big deal. Oops. All right. Alex and Duta says, uh, um, oh, yeah, make go ahead. sure to use the simple stack version that you have above. Oh, so good. It's not a different, different version. Good point. Might as well use that thing I defined. <laughs> yep. It is the same, but still. <laughs> What's the chat? Oh yeah, so Alex says before I understand the meaning of uh, business logic I suffered. To be honest, I still don't understand what that word means. I've heard several definitions. <laughs> I still don't know. It's still just this vague concept of like things which are kind of non-technical requirements implemented in code but yeah anyways you like this basic video <laughs> okay so we're we need to go to the activity and so what did i need to set up here with the services uh all you need to do is like you have the navigator configure set state changer and either above or below that there's also another call on navigator installer that's like set scope services and with the Lambda would, or? Not the Lambda. Um, you would pass it default service provider, which is an instance. Yeah. Okay. And there you go. Scope services will work now. <laughs> well, that was complicated. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Um, Okay, so let's have a look. So we had our splash view model. This would then extend. No, 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 no. You don't nope. need to extend anything. Oh, okay. Like uh, not even view model. You actually just don't need to extend anything. This is blowing my mind right now. So how does that work? <laughs> I know, right? You just want to keep a class alive. You don't need inheritance to do it. Um, yeah, so the okay, so... only other thing that you will need for the splash view model to actually be created is that if you have the splash key, then that will need to implement default services provider. No, I mean, default service provider dot has services. service provider dot has services. Yeah. And this should give you an underline saying that you need to implement something. Both of yeah. these? Yeah, 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 both of them. Okay. But for the scope tag, I typically just say to string because I already have this done with the, with the fragment tag, right? So like, this is why I tend to end up in the samples with something like fragment key and the fragment key is both default fragment key and has services. And then I just like always return to string for both the scope and the fragment tag. And this is why it needs to be a data class. Okay. Um, scope tag. So if I understand this correctly, this would be like the tag that the sort of 
your service providers would look for to see whether or not something should be held onto or not? Like it would look in the back stack? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good to know. This is how you know that if it's already been added. So this should be unique. <laughs> okay. And in the case of toString, it is. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and then what do we do down here? Uh, what I tend to do in the samples is say with uh, and then parentheses service binder. Oh. Yeah. Service binder? Uh huh. Yeah, you got it as a as a, an argument. And then just say add. Yep. And then you just call the constructor of the splash view model here. And that's it. Okay. So this is how you create a scope service. Wow. Okay. Uh, see, we got a question related to this. So very interesting. Is the splash key class auto generated? Um, Gabor, kindly explain how view models work in compose. Um, Wait, now I'm not sure which one. So is. yes, oh. so splash key is not auto generated. So um, what splash key is here is uh, Gabor will probably be able to explain this better, but it's kind of like uh, almost functions as like a fragment tag if you're familiar. It's almost like setting up a unique identifier for a particular fragment, and that particular fragment is splash fragment. So notice how it has instantiate fragment, and we're pointing it to splash fragment. Uh, if you want to add anything, Gabor, of course. That's pretty much exactly what it does, yes. <laughs> okay. It is an, an identifier and the arguments. These are the two things that the key has. Okay, perfect. Um, as far as explaining how view models work in Compose, could you be a little more specific, Alex? Or Like, you can just pass them in as a uh, an argument to the composables. Um, I think there's some weird thing with Jetpack view model where you can like ex instantiate a view model inside of a composable, but I probably wouldn't use that because <laughs> it's kind of uh, not really like, a... um, it gets tricky if you use navigation compose, which we, we do have an opinion about, but, uh, if you do use it, then, uh, then each composable and each navigation tag that you define as part of your nav graph in quotation marks in the nav host when using navigation compose, they each of them have their own associated nav backstack entry. And the nav backstack entry is a view model store owner and also a lifecycle owner and also a safety registry owner. So you can use the nav backstack entry as the view model store for creating a view model. And that's practically how you do it when you use compose navigation uh, and when you were to call something like view model then what it does is that it tries to find the local view model store owner the nearest look uh, view model store owner as the as the view model store for the view model that you're trying to create and that's practically the idea so you scope view models to nav backstack entries that's how Google intended it anyway. But right now we're not doing that. Yeah. I um I, I'm willing like I'm willing eventually to try out Compose Navigation, but I, I don't really plan to try it this year. Um and I, I'm not I think on occasion people who work on these libraries listen to me and think I'm being mean. I'm really not. I, I genuinely wish you luck in, in setting it properly and don't take it personally if I don't want to immediately use a, a newer tool. Um, I'm sure there, there's lots of places where the, the drawbacks of uh, Compose Navigation are discussed, so maybe jump on Twitter if you want to know. Um, <laughs> and, and honestly, like it, uh, that's generally going to be the case with like every time there's sort of a platform solution is it'll probably work pretty well in many situations and then it'll work like garbage in certain situations. I'm not saying that's the case with the Compose Navigation Library. That's just my general observation. Um, so you just have to be careful using them. 
Um, but they might eventually, you know, fix that. So, anyways. <laughs> uh, so, next question, which is quite important. Um, how do I get a dependency in here, Gabor? Like, let's say I had a... I don't know. I haven't set up uh, any of the services. You the but... constructor. So, here you invoke this constructor, right? So, yeah. here you would pass it. And this is where the global services I mentioned can come into play. That uh, if you want something like a retrofit API or something, then that typically gets registered as a, as a global service. And then in this, from the service binder, you just say look up and you will get a fake repository. Okay, just purely yeah, for demonstration purposes. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get my fake repository. Do you have an application class? I don't think I do, no. Uh, I kind of need one. Okay. Oh, wait. wait. No, that's not it. That's All right, it. let's just do uh, enter app. Application. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then and, we need uh, I guess on manifest. Create. Yeah, 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 manifest as well. Uh, uh, let's not forget about that. Yeah, like I almost always do. Um, <laughs> Android do name. I... Drop. Okay. And sorry, that was on create. Mm hmm Okay. And what I generally do is have a var global services, global services that's late in it and private set. So uh, var... Above on create, actually. Okay. Oh, I get you. And that was a var? Late in it var? Mm -hmm. Late in it. Uh... Global services. Oh. Yep. And Just like that? now we can create this here in. Yep. And the wait versus global services dot builder. Ooh, the builder pattern. Yeah, I mean, it's a Java library, so what would it be? Yep. Uh, and then dot Effective add. Java. You want to use add. Just add, OK. Yeah, and then you would. Do you have an interface? You don't have an interface over the fake repository, but uh, you probably want one. <laughs> Just to have like the full picture here. Uh, no, not not what I mean. Like, uh, if you have a fake repository, then there's typically a repository interface, and the fake repository implements the repository interface. That's what I mean. But if you want to pass fake repository directly, you can also do that. But it's kind of suspicious. It's sus. <laughs> okay. I actually um want. Oh no, that's not. Right. I actually want to um ask you about something later which is kind of an architectural thing because you've been saying for a while that uh you don't like repositories you'd rather see use cases and later on i want to ask you sort of hopefully specifically what you mean there but let's uh okay so and then i would pass the here what i would do because you also have to define it as the interface is uh above this a global services creation, I would have wall, fake repo impo equals fake repo impo. Oops. What the hell, autocomplete? <laughs> ah, it did seem correct. Oh, you don't you don't need to specify this type here. You just need to like be equals fake repo impo. You will actually now experience what Hilt is generating behind the scenes, but on the other hand, to be honest, this is less code. Uh, yeah, so you add this instance, and the other thing we should do after this, because this is fine. No, 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 you don't, don't do that, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> go one line below and say dot rebind. Oh, inside or no? Uh, here. No, one below, yeah, here, rebind. And here you define this repository interface thing, and also 
pass it fake repo info, and then dot build. All right. Okay. So and now this... you will actually be. Oh wait, you need to still set the global services on the navigator in the activity. Okay. Oh shit. There we go. Okay. Uh, so in here, presumably. Yeah. Set global services. And, and then, then it's con... application as unter up. <laughs> It needs to be in parentheses and then say global services. Okay. And with that, you basically have what Hilt is doing. This Yay. is cr cr so, yeah, this basically handles dependency injection for me, right? That is correct. This is inversion of control. Wow. This and is now crazy. all you need to do in uh, in the what's it called splash view model is called lookup and it will work. Um, oh yeah, here you wanna have the constructor argument which was like I fake repository. Yeah. Okay. And now what I tend to do is just say find usages on the splash view model itself. Uh, so, so like I tend to click on no 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 like I tend to click on splash view model okay find usages and that way you find the oh. constructor because because this one thing is not automatic new instance creation it says on the bottom left new instance creation okay yep and here double click oh I get and you and you just say look up. And just press center. Done. <laughs> wow. This is like a non annotation based in add inject <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Basically, just like what Coin is doing. <laughs> wow. This is crazy. Like, so I came into this like basically thinking, oh yeah, we'll just replace Jetpack uh, navigation. And then all of a sudden, like we we've replaced Vita model. I probably wasn't going to use Hilt anyways, but this is easier than what I was going to do. Um, so this is pretty friggin' hilarious, um, and good. I mean that in a very good way. Holy crap! There's a lot of years of work and put into it. Like the funny thing about these uh, scope services is that I had like six attempts of scoping before this, before I settled on the seventh and the eighth, which is what you have now. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Awesome. But yeah, this is what I came up with eventually, and I haven't come up with anything better. Cool. Um, we got a question from Cybershark. Um, will this fail lookup in runtime if configured wrongly? Course. Oh, the lookup. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where where is it? Lookup. Okay. Although when people say, but then you should use Hilt because it's compile time safe, I recommend uh, forgetting to add Android entry point on a fragment and let's see if it's compile time safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, Breen's asks, um, is it possible to share your custom view model with iOS? Uh, I don't wish. think so. If, mm -hmm. um, so you know, I believe that what does make me wonder, like, uh, the instantiation is done in the key, but the view model itself is now, um, how do you call it? Um, not platform specific, but if you were to want to use scope services that registered, you would probably end up being platform specific because it comes from a Java library. We're oh, okay. so close to sharing everything. Ah. <laughs> it's getting there. Awesome. All right. Um, cool. I think the only other thing for, um, how much time do you have, Gabor, by the way? Um, 
objectively i f lately i feel like i never have time for anything so now okay. i just choose to like do things i want to do <laughs> okay well let let me know uh, um whenever um i think there's two things so uh let's say we get into our so we're in our splash fragment which is not required as of android 12 um so i want to be able to check um auth state presumably maybe we can just pretend that the fake repository could do that um kind of how would i set that up here uh the way you typically get uh, a reference to the um, to a service like a scope service is to say private wall oh wait you actually have the view model it you have it in the view model Hold on a second. Where do we want to handle it? Because we can handle it in either place, but oh. like either in the fragment or the view model. I guess I'd rather hand handle it. So this is a point of debate. Um, I think some people would prefer to handle it in the fragment. I mm -hmm. generally don't, but I see arguments both ways. I guess for yeah, me, so let's let's do the view model. Okay, so for that, all you need to do is, apart from the fake repository, you also want to get the reference to the backstack. So be like comma, wall backstack backstack. Add it to the constructor. You will actually just need to say uh, oh. comma, not lookup. For the backstack, you want to use just comma and backstack. Not here, not here. Oh, not here, okay. <laughs> no, 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 here. And you just say comma backstack and it works. Wow, it just works. Yeah. <laughs> this is, Gabor, the, you know what the problem with this library is? It's not complicated enough. <laughs> I know. I actually have heard this before. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm programming wrong here. This is too easy. <laughs> I There should be some like weird thing I have to statically call. <laughs> I think you can definitely create an object which implements creation key dot extras and has a generic argument and then you will be able to get that from a big map for which you need to extend fragment and override the creation extras return from the fragment or now we're where talking. you add it to the mutable creation extras and stuff. I'm sure you can also do that, but here you, because you're not using view models, you're using scope services. You actually just pass the backstack and it works. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to refrain from commenting further because um, what I would say would probably irritate some people. But yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> No, but okay. yeah, technically with view orders, you could also achieve the same thing, but you do have to create the creation key extras. I No, you need the creation extras key. You need to add it to the mutable creation extras and you have to override the fragment so that it returns it to the view model as a creation extra. And you have to not use held. <laughs> mm. Perfect. Then you would be able to do this in a view model as well. <laughs> oh man, okay. So um, let's say, I don't know, this is, so people watch it, this is just pseudocode. I'm just screwing around here. Uh, let's say get user, I don't know. Um, let's just make this a little easier for the code generation. Cyber Shark was asking how to get activity scoped services into the fragments key other than global services. And this was actually a request, which I in uh, eventually added. I personally haven't needed it, but I did add it, which is that instead of the uh, scope services being passed as is now, there's also uh, another overload where you can set a scope services factory. And in that factory, you would be able to have uh, activity scope things. The, the problem with that, the reason why I don't like doing that is because the what you're configuring is the non-config scope. So it's not really activity scoped per se. It's more like view model scoped. So if anything was like instantiated in the activity and passed to it, then that would be a memory leak. 
Hmm. Because everything that's in a scoped service lives uh, in the non-config scope, like view models are. All right. So this is not how I'm actually going to do this, but we'll just pretend for a minute that um, a null user means that they're not logged in. Um, I mean, it makes sense, Kotlin wise. <laughs> yep. All right. So user, um, I forgot how to write Kotlin now. Does that work? It would work, yeah. Okay, I feel like I had to use as or something, but no, that doesn't make sense. It is. All right, uh, and then we'll just do else. I would just say if user is not null. I know. <laughs> I, I but like this the when. also works. I like the when. Stage. I also like when. I also like when. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna disagree with you on this one. <laughs> okay. Um. So and this is kind of like a. Okay, so let's say maybe, um, send to um, login. And then we can throw in, I don't know, whatever, send to dashboard. All right. So and so what will we do? Um, wait a minute. OK, so yeah, so here we would do the conditional navigation, or? Well, you just did that just now with the check out state function. Yeah, I think I'm a little mixed up here, so. Don't get too confused. You can just write code here. OK. So how would I do the navigation, I guess? Uh, you call backstack.setHistory, because you probably don't want to keep the splash screen. Probably not. OK. So yeah, set, set history, is this almost history like also. clear the backstack? It does indeed clear the entire backstack and replaces it with whatever you're giving it. Okay, cool. All right, and then I think uh, so. We would do login key. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Actually, uh, you need to you when you're using set history, you give it a list. So uh, it's uh, history dot off login key, and that will work. Oh, history dot off. Okay. A list of would also work, but I use history dot off because historical reasons. It's a it's a big like capital H. It's basically a list with some extra functions in it. Um, direction. Yeah, direction, yeah. which is state change dot forward. This is like the one thing that I was like, I'm pretty sure there could have been. <laughs> better way to name it, but this is the one thing I need to remember. Can you uh, kind of, as simple as possible, explain, so what exactly is uh, state change dot for? Like, I'm assuming it's something to do with, it's like a we're explaining how to navigate to login key? Like, it's the direction of the navigation, which is only important for the animation. OK. So that as you're like oh. translating forward instead of like it translating to the other direction, like it's not back, it's forward. So it goes forward in its animation. Oh, cool. So it does animations too. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and then this would just be, uh... yeah, that's, that's basically it. So we can handle navigation. Cool. Yeah, and dashboard. This would and be I dashboard to yeah. YouTube. Oh, this would be uh so we'd have to check. Um Do we? Yeah, oh, just oh, there's yeah, a, yeah, there's that. some state I need to check in the uh, user object. And, uh, user dot type. This is one annoying thing at Firebase doesn't seem to support enums, so I've got to figure out some way to Either I just keep using do, people watching in the chat. Don't do what I'm doing here. This is 
I have to figure out a better way to do this. Normally I'd use an enum, but Firebase doesn't support them out of the box, so I'll probably have to map it somehow. All right, and then we would do uh, passenger dashboard key and then direction forwards are already there. Okay, and then driver. Cool. All right, so yeah, just as a, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Just as a proof of concept, okay, we can, we've implemented basically conditional navigation. So, wow. Yep. Uh, we got a question. Um, I, you just need to also call a checkout state at some point. <laughs> sorry, I should do what? Uh, invoke the checkout state function at some point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be in the fragment. You can actually handle it here because you're using scope services. Oh, no. Like in init or something? Uh, not well. You can either use init. I was thinking of scope services that activated, but it's really up to you. You can also do it in the fragment. Okay, it explain. <laughs> so, is that something that this thing? Where is scope services dot activated? I remember it's in the interface. Yeah, it is an interface. If your scope service implements it, then you get this optional callback. So would I, I would say scope service like that? I feel well, like I did this wrong. I always look at YouTube, not, not scope services, scope services dot activated. It's yeah, that one. And now you would be getting these callbacks. Okay. So here we I would... have heard a complaint saying that why do I inherit empty functions and it's because it's a Java 1.7 library. So oh, there okay. were no default functions at the time. You don't want to keep a to do with your crash. There. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, and yes, people watching the stream, I know that's unnecessary. Uh, adding unit in there. Um, okay, uh, we had a question. So, Galbar, is it possible to have a view pager with tab view with simple stack? Anything is possible, although the uh, would you the want fragment to? that hosts the view pager is what would be in simple stack, and the fragments hosted in the view pager are child fragments of it, and child fragments are generally not managed by simple stack. You could write the state changer for it, but it's tricky enough that I personally do not write <laughs> state changers for that. Oh, okay. I will, I generally use it for like the top level fragment navigation. I don't use it for child management. Good to know. Okay, Gabor, I think I only have one thing that I want to ask you if uh, if you've got a bit of time here. Okay. So um, I, you and I have both talked quite a lot about software architecture and clean architecture and its use and misuse. And something you said a while ago, let's get rid of this horrendous Comic Sans shit. Um is uh, one thing I've heard you say before is um, so people will say, for example, skip the use case and just do the repository. And in that context, I most of the time what they're saying is if your use case is just one single extra arbitrary layer between whatever is calling the use case, probably a view model or whatever, and the repository, then it is absolutely pointless to have that use case. And I think we actually both agree on that point, right? Definitely. Okay. And But I've heard you say, actually, the repository is pointless. Or something, don't let me put words in your mouth, but you would rather go That's with the use case. That's what I tend to say. And so I just want to understand, 
Because the way I thought about, think about repositories is kind of different from like the Jetpack thing. Um, actually, maybe code might be a little better thing. Uh, just give me a minute here. Um, I kind of thought, okay, assuming our use case is just an extra arbitrary layer, in a sense, the functions of the repository kind of become the use cases. Um, and I just want to understand your perspective. You're sort of saying, skip the repository. Well, so, when I talk about repository and say, you probably don't need this repository, I generally think of it in the context of the uh, Jetpack version of repositories, which is uh, meant to synchronize the network calls and the local database. That's specifically what they do. People these days call everything a repository. So like yeah. uh, in this case, we have this fake repository, which could be called, I don't know, user repository, in which case what we would have normally called this is something like session manager. But there was a lot of talk about how you shouldn't have managers in your code. And so uh, people renamed managers to repositories. So if you think of it that way, a stateful class that represents a global application state, then yeah, you will need repositories. The difference is that we typically call them a manager and not a repository because the repository as a term comes with this loaded idea that you also need to have a network request in there and database synchronization and maybe make it stateful but if you saw the original article then it shouldn't be stateful and like repository really is a mess in this regard but um, use cases are just stateless operations that you can invoke which do something that that's really it if if it makes sense for you to encapsulate an operation as its own class, then do it. And if you already have a class that already does the thing you want, and it's okay to know that class, then definitely don't make one. That That's my general idea here. <laughs> like I would not create a class called get user here, which, which returns a user instance. Like you do have this uh, session manager class that already contains the current user or not. Like you don't need an extra layer of abstraction. Okay. So I suspected this, but I wanted to hear this straight from you because I've heard you, like I've heard you say, you know, forget the repository and just use use cases. And um, I wasn't sure sort of the context of that. Like normally what I do, so of course I went through the clean Android architecture thing phase where I had single yeah, class. Yeah. If you're old enough, you have gone through it. I've also gone through it. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm There's like... There's a reason why I wouldn't go back to it. Yeah. And then I'm like, okay, well, I, let's just get rid of that. And essentially, to me, the... Um, yeah, this should be... I'm going to break everything. But this should... Let's say we have like I user repository or just user repository. I know some people don't like the prefix. Um, the functions here would essentially be act as like the use cases or the, d fulfill the same role as those use cases, except it wouldn't, um, we're not having like two layers of this essentially, like delete user. So for me, this repository is kind of like a way of grouping um, use case functions together. And um, you don't necessarily see an issue with that. Well, personally, like it, this is basically bike shedding because uh, because when we name this stuff, it's typically something like session manager, and the get user would be something like get logged in user, and the delete user would be like log out. <laughs> in this particular case. Like there's this semantic meaning added to these functions. So it's not like uh, the user repository will delete this user. But if all it does is delete the user, then definitely call it delete user. Like you want to just represent as much of the intention as you can 
in your code. And for that, you don't need additional classes. You definitely shouldn't add the use case just because I said, hey, we use use cases, not repositories. Yeah, because apparently we call repositories managers. You do need something that holds application state sometimes. <laughs> okay. And we only have these use case like layers if the API call has additional effects. Like um, if, if all the use case would do is call the retrofit API, then just don't add it. There's no point. <laughs> so in, in that case, would you have the retrofit API like in the view model or? I tend to do that. I know yeah. it's very divisive, but not the retrofit interface specifically. I tend to have an additional interface which okay. uh, has an extra implementation and that implementation delegates to the retrofit interface. And the reason why I do oh, okay. that is that like about nine out of 10 times, retrofit works perfectly fine, but in that 10th case, it doesn't. And I need to use an okay HTTP call directly. And if you were to pass the retrofit interface to everything, you would be like, oh, wait, how will I make this into an OK HTTP call? I will just mess around for a day or two with retrofit, hoping it will work, even though it won't. Typically with image uploads and uh, yeah, I think I had oh. trouble with some image uploads at some point because the server was silly. Multiple image uploads? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like We dealt with that in the last step. Just comes up. It just comes up that retrofit, it handles all these 99 cases. There's 100 fun. And so I prefer to have it wrapped in an interface. And then <laughs> some people look at it and they're surprised. They're like, why would you wrap an interface with an interface? But it's true. You just don't want to expose retrofit as the thing that you're talking to. You want to expose an interface. And retrofit is the implementation. OK. Interesting. All right. So yeah, That's I just have you on it. Yeah. So that 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 makes me feel a lot better cuz I um I uh basically what I'm getting from the the conversation we've just had here is is a um we're pretty much doing the same thing just uh but different names. Different names, yeah. And, that's why but, that's why I say it's practically bike shedding. Like you're doing yeah. the same thing. It's it's just whether uh, like which name what is do you call better <laughs> like okay is it better is it worse can we really even tell like i just okay. i just really like code that explains what it does just by looking at it you you look at it and you're like oh yeah this thing will tell me if the user is logged in and this thing i if i call log out it will log out stuff like that so you don't need to know that in order to log out, I need to call delete user. But if you do need to delete user from the database, then it is in fact called delete user. Like the intent should match the function name. The class should represent the intent for what this class intends to do. Yeah. So uh, it's really just naming. Okay. I am cool. not going to tell you to create uh, layers upon layers that you don't need. Yeah, and that's one thing yeah, we've, I think, yeah, for years, totally agreed on. Um, yeah. Shit, I had one more thing I wanted to say, but my brain forgot now. Um, that's okay. Sorry, I interrupted you too much, and you forgot what you wanted. Ah. No, I, I'm perfectly capable of forgetting things without people interrupting me, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. So, uh, quit car... Oh, sorry, let me, I jumped ahead. So Cybershark says, I've been doing repos and managers. What would be a good example to use use cases if something like a delete note use case in a note-taking app is unnecessary abstraction? So my response would be, I think it depends on how many steps are required to delete a note. So like if you're literally just making one single call to the database, for example, then... It's kind of like that's where we're getting into the realm. But let's say you had some weird synchronization, like you have online and offline caching and you need to like wait for some response to make sure the remote successfully deletes the user before you do this and that. That might be a situation where 
Again, the problem is what does use case mean, but where you might need something back there making some decisions. Um, Gabor, what do you think? I think you're absolutely right, Ryan. Like, uh, I always tend to think about the banking apps that we write where we end up with use cases, which is what I tend to refer to as we don't have repositories, we have use cases. Yeah, because we're talking to an API, <laughs> it's not really stateful, but it is complex. Like sometimes you invoke this one function and they give you these response codes that say that, hey, if the result code is A and this thing is something else, then the user is has a card, but it's inactive. So you have to handle it as a special case and that. So like there's this transformation happening to decide that, uh, okay, so I got this response. What does it mean and what do I need to do? And this sort of uh, intention transformation in a way that uh, you get this response and did I successfully log in or do I have an inactive card or do is my card blocked? Is it stuff like that. And you have these eight result cases and they come as some sort of result code like A or B or F or I don't even know, or you have no cards, so you cannot log in. You're not even the real user. So there are like these seven error cases and this one success case. And so you have the use case where you do these checks to see if the result code is this and this, the return that the result was that the user has no cards. The result is that the user is blocked. The result is that, uh, I don't know, there, there are seven of them. So okay. in a sense, that's when you want to end up with, that's when we have something that's use case like. It's complex. It's not just, hey, here's the result and then let the view model decide, hey, if the result code was A, <laughs> like, I don't want to see this when no. I'm writing logic. Yeah. Um. One thing I, when I just forget all the words and just try and define it the way I think about it. Let's say we have this magical boundary between the, and this is on the client side, the front end, so the presentation layer, and then like the back end domain, whatever, of the uh, client application. Sometimes you need a back end decision maker if the, the logic is complex enough. And most often you'll need some kind of front end decision maker, which will be a presenter or a view model or whatever. But you only need these things if the logic is actually of a level of complexity where decisions need to be made, hence this term decision maker. So that's kind of ignoring like, what is a use case? What is a repository? Sometimes we, we need classes to represent this logic. Oh. Yeah, to be honest, okay. we typically don't even call them use cases. I don't remember a single time we called them use cases. Like in the banking app, it was called a workflow because that's what people call them. Like the everyone on the project calls them a workflow. And on another project, I had to like write this offline first app where uh, the user can make edits even offline. And in that case, uh, we call them operations and you would be able to schedule an operation as you made an edit. So it's like, that's what people would think is a use case, but we don't call it that. Nobody calls it that. <laughs> yep. Um, Cybershark follows up. So basically when the delete note function in the repo would become too big or require multiple other sub functions for readability, a use case would be better. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that because um, just the implementation of the repository function could include that logic. So we're kind of just getting back into, as Gabor said, bike shedding. Cybershark also says, I have seen something like delete node pipeline. And Ooh, to pipeline. be honest, it's pretty accurate. That's basically what's going on. <laughs> Yeah. If if it's a multi-step operation, then sure, you can definitely create a class for it so that you cannot end up with calling one part of it without calling the other part of it if both parts are required for the functionality to work. Like, you want to encapsulate things that belong together. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Um, Quitcar says, 
So wait, we shouldn't have more than one method in a single use case class? I generally don't uh, know. Because it's an operation, it is the thing that is being executed. So why would the use case have multiple functions? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Quick car then says, I have a CRUD interface and a use case product class that implements all of its CRUD functions. Shall I create a use case for each CRUD function? Uh, <laughs> probably not. Again, what we come back to is if the use case is just like an extra arbitrary like layer, then it's its usage, its functionality or purpose is questionable. So like maybe if you, um, so you're saying you have a CRUD interface in the use case. So yeah, that sounds very like it's just not doing anything. But again, if multi, like if there is actually some logic to like coordinate multiple databases or network adapters or whatever, maybe. But if, yeah, it, let me, I'll just give a code example to explain. So um, where's our fake use case I just made? Did I delete it already? Um, I think I deleted it. I'll just throw this together really quick. Um, let's say, we'll call it delete user just as an example. Let's say this is a use case. If this has a function delete, user and this thing has like val database uh, uh, some let's say i database i don't really care if this thing is literally um database dot delete user and then you pass the user in you can see here like why am i doing this what is the purpose? What is the purpose of this delete user class? To, it's like it's just an extra layer. <laughs> it it doesn't solve any problems. If there was like i database, i network, um, just pretend they're different interfaces. I cache. And you had to like coordinate all of these different things just to delete a user, then we're in a different territory. All right. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up pretty quick here. Uh, if you have any final comments or questions for Gabor or anything like that, uh, Tomislav asks, um, I just joined. How much progress did you make? Holy crap. I. I thought I was just going to implement navigation, and now we've basically replaced Jetpack View Models and Hilt um, with stuff that is simpler to use. So we made a lot of progress. <laughs> All right. Uh, Shashank asks, Gabor, I wonder why you don't teach on Twitch or YouTube like once in a while. You know so much that it is worth sharing. Honestly, that's a good idea. I don't know a good answer to that at this time. Is it time constraints? That too. Although objectively, we all have 24 hours a day. Reduce a bit from sleep and you have a bit more time. <laughs> that's bad advice, but <laughs> objectively, it'd be doable. Uh, well, we'll see about that. I will give you an update on that. Currently, I've mostly just been tweeting and on Reddit in that regard and on Discord, but not on YouTube and not on Twitch. And you do have, like, you do write articles from time to time, if I'm correct. Well, I didn't write one last year, but otherwise, yes. <laughs> you know, the reason why I didn't, I wanted to write an article about how to use Model View Presenter in Jetpack Compose because people think it's impossible, but I also don't want to like let people know <laughs> how to do it because then they'll actually do it and they shouldn't because it's a terrible idea. 
And after that, I just basically <laughs> dead logged on. Okay, then what to write about, and then I, it got stuck. Okay. <laughs> oh, like man. the very concept of model view presenter was a bad idea because of the uh, way the state is propagated to the views to be rendered. Like we finally have the one positive aspect of Compose, which is that it makes very difficult to do model view presenter like logic where the presenter tells the view what to do and has complete knowledge of, of uh, what the, how the view behaves as a result of all these function calls. And I don't know, man, I'm not sure I should point out how you can do this with disposable effects. <laughs> I, so I actually, before in compose, had like um so i did actually still have a presenter and the way that it would communicate with the composables was indirectly through the observe the composables observing a view model so it was kind of like mvp vm and uh it's like too much it's too much unless you have like a some really complicated presentation logic but yeah there is ways to do it I'm not saying I recommend it, but I gotta add Google Services JSON to Git Ignore. All right, um, we got. Uh, let's see, one more question, Quitcar. I'm trying to to use Firebase Phone Auth with MVVM, but its builder requires an Activity instance. How can I achieve that? Are you using Compose or View System and Fragments? Are you, I'm assuming you're in a fragment. I don't know. It's going to be tricky to answer your question, quick car, without knowing more about how you're trying to do it. I mean, personally, I tend to say that uh, architectural purity should not get in the way of getting things done. So if the Firebase yes. phone requires an activity, then you won't move an activity to the view model because that's a memory leak. You don't want to do that. I have seen people set a weak ref a static global weak reference to the currently started activity, <laughs> but I would generally not recommend doing that. I, I would just do it in the activity or fragment, like use it as it was meant to be used. The more hex you add, the less, um, like the more steps it will require later to decipher why you did what you did and what you wanted to achieve. <laughs> and if there's an easier way, then it's the more steps that people need to undo in order <laughs> to do their simpler way. Yeah, I, for a couple of years now, I've been saying, follow your architecture or your principle only to the extent that it solves more problems than it creates. and when you're running into a situation like this where it's a problem to follow the architecture, like Gabor said, then stick it in the activity. <laughs> yeah, do get, it. <laughs> get her done. And get activity if in a fragment, correct. Yeah, yeah, that works. Okay, I think that'll be it for today. Thank you so much, Gabor, for uh, joining me today. Uh, it's been super fun and I my mind is literally blown. No, figuratively, <laughs> but my mind is figuratively blown at, like, yeah, that, man, the, uh, if the Android team ever watched the tutorial, they're going to be pissed. <laughs> I think they already hate me, though, so that's okay. I don't think they hate you. I know they dislike me because I typically criticize, hey, you have all this cool stuff, but this doesn't work, and they're like... We worked four years on this, and this guy is like, this doesn't work in this one specific case, and it does. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know, man. Like creation extras and here, like yeah, most people don't even want to use it. I'm not even sure if anyone even, like, if if people even know about creation extras. Like, but I see the potential and the potential, but the yeah, the potential is thwarted by how. This feature doesn't exist, right? Yep. Uh, like they see some more malice in there than 
that really is like I'm not intending to be malicious. I typically just want to warn people, hey, if you use this, then this is what you need to keep in mind because this is when you would run into an edge case or something. Like navigation compose, if you want to pass a dollar sign as part of your string and you didn't use URI encoding, then your app will crash. And th this, there's nothing like malicious about this. This is just something you have to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. And it it does to be honest it on the sidelines it irritates me. Um, like I understand what you're doing. It, it's not like you're just being mean. It's like you're literally pointing out things that are wrong and potentially going to cause problems. And that's very different from just arbitrarily crapping on things. So, yeah. But, you know, I, at the end of the day, you, you just got to do you and yeah, <laughs> whatever. If you Honestly, don't like at it. At this point, it's been so many years, it may as well stay the same. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. And uh, obviously, this episode will be available uh, later on if you want to rewatch it. I highly suggest it because we, I can't even begin to describe now how much <laughs> Simple Stack is going to be doing in this application. Yeah, um, I need to thank you for giving scope services a chance. I think it works really well. Like, there's a lot of work and thought put into it, and we have been using it successfully in multiple applications. And people are often like, "Yeah, but I want to use view models," and I'm like, "You're missing out." But you can. Like, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. This is just an option, but it's good. <laughs> it, yeah, it didn't take long to set up. All like, right. Uh, Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, Ryan.